But I think with that, we're ready to start talking about the nuts and bolts of this episode. Yes, yeah, and 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 really, actually, indeed, dive into the nuts and bolts of Bitwarden because here we're going to be talking about the instance configuration. So this talks, uh, this this is about actually setting up uh, the Bitwarden server and, and not merely deploying it, but like once it's deployed, what is available to me? What do I need to tweak? What do I need to be aware of? You know, security settings, uh, personal settings, stuff like that, uh, and then also checking in on the clients. You know, what what is available to me? What can I do with these clients? First of all, there's a dark mode. So you have to be aware of that. That has to be number one. Of course. Glad you brought that up. Beyond that, beyond that, what are we going to do? Right. So uh, taking a look into our uh, instant settings here. So in in Bookstack, I I copy literally from Bitwarden's documentation, their official documentation, the the stuff about their admin portal. Right. So um, accessing the admin portal. What is what is what is the admin portal, right? And and mainly it's for any systems administrator, you know, and and uh, the the R Compose administrator is automatically the administrator of Bitwarden, right? Um, logging into the admin portal, right? And and how do you do that? So uh, walking through that, um, and then once that admin portal is accessed, right? What do you need to be aware about? So. Um, it's good to be aware that there are a couple settings that we do not set by default and that you wish, might wish to change, right? Uh, and, and there are a lot here, uh, and I just highlighted several that I think are important. Yeah. Um, so in order of appearance, the first one you come across is allowing new signups. So that by default is true, uh, and we leave it true for the time being, right? So this may seem counterintuitive until you realize that we set up the initial user based on this availability. This also lets us easily onboard any additional users onto the instance. Uh, however, it is worth looking into as an option to set when creating the instance. Uh, it does not cause a major attack vector, especially with additional uh, restrictions introduced. Um, also, it enables uh, zero it doesn't enable any data leakage as it simply allows additional accounts to be enabled on the system, right? Um, so this may be, this may set off some alarm bells to, to people, but like anyone can sign up for an account on your instance if this is checked, right? And, and this is how we release it to you. Like, first of all, the the thing I don't want to have come back uh, to say is, oh, I tried to set up accounts for all of my users and I couldn't do couldn't that. Do it, right? Right. No one could log in. Like the worst thing you want to hear is no one can log in because then there's like 500 other problems that, that could possibly be going wrong. And and simply this one is, is going to be the easiest to solve. So we want to get past that hurdle, uh, the first part. Uh, and then the next thing is actually coming up right next. So that's actually setting attachment limits. So setting attachment limits avoids the really large attack vector from leaving account registrations open, which is to run an instance out of space by uploading very large attachments. So if you remember what I was talking about earlier when we were running out of space because of run deck logs, right? It's not actually that we're running out of space, you know, because we can add any space that's necessary. However, that is at an additional cost, right? So what we want to do is we want to minimize that. Uh, what an attacker could do here is create an account and then just start uploading large, Gibberish. large files, yeah. right? Um, I think we do have something in Nginx that limits that to a certain uh, like like uploads to a certain level, it's not just uh, infinite. Uh, so there is that buffer there, but this would be something additionally to set uh, on top of that. Uh, so setting setting that that limit avoids the attack vector of just running out to space. Now we don't set that by default. Uh, that is something that we could look into setting by default, but we just we just don't right now. Uh, there's there's no reason. There's been no call yet. Um, and then every instance, you know, the admin can turn on or off um, the allowing new signups uh, or additionally putting an attachment limit on there as well. Because, um, you know, I don't want Jack to upload a, his photo album to Bitwarden. Yeah, I think it's going to be more li- more more likely uh, one long fi- one long string of uh, characters that's going to be, you know, gigs long. But it's actually just going to be a Ruby key. 
<laughs> yeah, but it's not going to be a file, though. So no. This is a I guess you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> a, f- a file. A file ends in a new line. It's just a string. A fi- <laughs> so and 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 I promise this is building something too. So this isn't this isn't necessarily random. So we're talking about uh, attachment sign or attachment limits, and then allowing new signups. Uh, additionally, the next section is SMTP email settings. So like most of the services offered, uh, because there is no currently bundled SMTP service, this is left blank. Uh, however, this can be connected to any email service that you may have set up. So there are many things in Bitwarden that can use an email. So like notifications or two factor or reminders or yada yada. So there's a lot of things that can use email and this would have to be filled out to provide that. We don't provide that yet. Um, but there it's there for you if you want to connect it to your Gmail, to your Yahoo, to whatever. And then you can send emails out from there. Uh, and then, then here we get to the part which ties those three things together is that email signup limitations, right? So implementing the above SMTP settings, uh, limits, it, it, well, you're able then to implement a signup limitation, right? Uh, so you can verify, require email verification on signups, right? So that is by default false because by default there's no email server, right? So if you turn that on, if you connect an email server and then turn on account verification via email, right? Then you you obviously have to every new account has to be, have a verified email. So that'll that'll block you know neighborhood hacker man who doesn't know about you know, uh, the, uh, the temporary email services. Um, so you have the temporary email services that you can use to get around that. But, but then, uh, at the very bottom, you do have an email domain whitelist sure. that's optional, right? Now this is, this is particularly interesting. If you have an organization whose email addresses are at your company.com, yeah. right? Then your email to limit your, your, then you're able to limit your signups, to emails that are verified that go to your company.com addresses, right? And voila, you have a, you know, you're, you're still able to allow open signups, but not everyone is able to sign up. So there's, there's a couple of ways to work around that problem. Um, and, and I did want administrators to be aware of that, um, so that they can adjust accordingly, right? I, I, I think the best solution and the solution that we're, we're working towards is to implement some type of a SMTP server or relay in there, right? I, I think that's certainly doable for CE infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to self-hosted infrastructure, I'm not sure, but you know, we can, we'll, we'll Look tackle those it. issues as we, as, Explore as we it, get yeah. there. Yeah. But for the time being, you know, anyone with a Bitwarden instance can add an email server. And have that whole preventative measure thing going on. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, I actually looked at the rest of the settings in the admin portal. There's there's not a whole lot really to add. I mean we're we're talking about it. It's really just storing encrypted blobs in a database. There's there's not a whole lot you can do. Now there are things about users and organizations, which Jack is going to cover next week. I think because those are the things that are still blank yep. in Bitwarden's documentation. Um, and if not that, other things, but we will get around to it eventually. Uh, those are really the only other things to be aware about in in uh, the instance settings. Um, however, th- when it comes to client settings, there are a lot more options, right? So, Jack, I mean, you use Bitwarden every day frequently yeah every day yeah obviously every day what are to. you know what what have you i mean when's the last time you really set up a client though like when's when's the last time you you added something new I have a vaulty on a different workstation and i set it up for that and honestly it ended up just being i just leave my I, shame on me i left i ended up leaving i set it up and i left my settings default i i think part of that was because Ooh, i was no, adding no dark mode I, Did no, you not even? Nope. No, no, oh, no. no. I uh, configured oh, no. all my add-ons, oh, no. and Bitwarden was one of them. I got signed in immediately, and it was fine. Uh, you know what, though? The now that, I, now that I say I didn't configure anything, I do configure the timeout. I don't like how it logs me out after, like, it's too short for me. So I end up upping it to, I think it's like four hours or something. Um, so that's perfect because that is the first setting I have here uh, in the documentation is the vault locking. Now that is common to all clients, uh, which is the the 
the vault timeout. So the vault timeout is where you choose uh, when your vault will timeout and perform the selected action. And that is then obviously paired with the timeout action. So what do you actually want it to do? Uh, and there's two things. There's lock and log out. So per yeah. their little help text here, right? Locking is a lock vault requires that you re-enter your master password to access it again. And then logged out is a logged out vault requires that you re-authenticate to access it again. Right. Man, I think I think I'm going to have to use so that. The, logged out instead of lock i mean if if you want i i would not prefer that really i just lock it i just lock it yeah so it it does basically the same thing yeah i know one requires a password and one requires username and or email and password yeah exactly um and 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 logging out means that uh nothing will get synced uh if there is new stuff pushed you know it's it's Everything is there like you were logged in, except a user can't actually access anything. So I I always lock everything. It's it's easier for me. And, and why it's easier for easier for me, right? It's easier to unlock. Yeah. So if you we actually jump down uh, to the specifically browser add on and mobile client section. Uh, the second setting I have there is unlock with biometrics slash pin code. Oh, nice. Yeah. So this yeah. allows you to log in with a pin or biometrics. So like a fingerprint reader uh, on your phone. This is much more convenient after setting up a device than having to retype your master password over and over again. Totally. Right? So a, a browser uh, add on or your phone, right? You can lock it with your, your phone's pin and just unlock it with your, you know, yeah, whatever you can do fingerprint reader, or you can set up a pin for your browser add on so that when you go into your browser add on, you don't have to type your, your whole master password. password again. Yeah. You, cause you've already proven that, you know, you're your logged master in. password, right. right? You just go in and, and put in your pin. Now, I choose a master password because I, I, it's just muscle memory at this point. So I'm not even concerned with that. That's kind of how, how I am. I feel like a pin is just one more thing. Now, biometrics, you know, what you are is right there. So might have might have to explore that one. That is a game changer on mobile. I'll tell you that. It makes it so easy. It makes it so easy to autofill on mobile. Um now, something about the vault locking, uh, the settings are different for the browser add-on, like I said, which allows for timeout to be screen lock and or, uh, so, so it allows for the timeout to be different as well. Uh, so it allows for it to be a screen lock and or a computer restart, right? So you can also have those triggers in addition to the purely time-based system. Um, and then as well, the mobile app, you can uh, have it timeout at an app restart so if you kill the app and restart it it'll force you to uh to unlock as well Uh, so there's there's a couple other things when it comes to that uh versus the web client which is just plain time-based yeah yeah so there's there's different ways to to do that the other main setting uh, that is common to all of the devices that I think is important is changing the master password. Uh, so, sure. so first of all, this is important Absolutely. to know that you can do this, right? In in the event that you feel the need to do this, absolutely you can. Right? We're we're not locking you into the same to, password to, forever, right? But but it does interrupt things a lot, especially if you have multiple devices, right? Because you're going to have to uh, sign out and sign back in f- with the new pa- master password, right? You're not going to get synced uh, stuff, right? So uh, the, the the warning on the web vault here says that active sessions on other devices may continue to remain active for up to one hour. And that's due to the way it, it syncs, right? Because once you change the master password, all the blob addressing changes, Right. So what is being requested by the other vault clients is invalid at that point because your master password has changed. So they need the new updated info. So you're going to have to go to your browser. You're going to have to go to your mobile. Right. Any other device is going to have to have your new master password, not simply unlocked like we were talking about. They're going to have to have it resynced with the new master password. Uh, So there there are options in the other clients to trigger uh, master password change, but they do simply direct you to the web vault. So 
you're going to be doing it on the web vault anyways, uh, but just there is the option in there. If if you don't understand what changing the master password is, it'll bump you to the web vault. And it'll say, okay, here's the little warning. Sign in. Here's yeah. how you do it, and, and, and it'll walk you through that. Okay, so I see a little checkbox there to rotate your encryption key. Have you done that one before? Do you recommend that? I didn't even look at the little pop-up there. Uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you what that is. It, it it definitely has to do with how Bitwarden's encryption works. They have um, a security section under their help uh, location on their website where it goes over all of the encryption stuff. So I know I did a terrible job. It was like two episodes ago going over that. Uh, they do a much better job describing how all that encryption works and uh, what crypto libraries they're using, how they're using it. Um, what AES CBC is and, and, and just going over all that. So uh, I'm sure that'd be in there. I just didn't feel the need to dive into that right now. I mean, it's a check. You can check the checkbox and hope the clients do the right thing. I mean, this, this is a pretty, I've never, I've never run into issues with Bitwarden. It's always been rock stable for me. I am in the same boat. Knock on wood. Last thing we need. Yeah. Maintain yeah. backups, right? Well, Maintain and Maintain backups. And like I said, well, yeah, of course there's backups. But like I said, there's the, the the cool thing is that all the clients if the server gets disconnected can still run on, offline, right? It's just they're not going to get any synced updates and nothing's going to change for them. So um it's it's a fairly robust system, you know, even even in, you know, like an EMP type situation, right? When everything comes back online and all the servers are gone, I'm still going to Hey, be able to log into the websites my, yeah. that aren't up anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to be able to open my, my Bitcoin wallet that has no more connectivity to the blockchain. Yep. So. Very useful. Yay. <laughs> uh, all right. What do we got here? What do we got here? Um, so that is all of the common settings for, for all the clients. Um, there is one specifically for the web app that I wanted to point out, just a little quality of life improvement, uh, which is enable full width layout. Uh, so it actually, when you're logging in and, and doing stuff on Bitwarden, it takes up the rest of the screen and not just, you know, a portion of it. And uh, one of one of my big quirks is is that I love when stuff does that and hate when stuff doesn't do that. Uh, I, I, I think I spent, let's just call it way too long. Um, on my my own personal blog, Jekyll blog thing, trying to make that the case so that it was responsive, that it would that would grow and 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 shrink based on the the size of of the uh, of the the viewport there because I was like, this text is taking up like one third of the screen. What? Why is it even? <laughs> yeah, why right, do I even right. care about this screen? You know, expand thyself. So yeah, this is this is something that does that for you for you. Um, and then we have the uh, the browser add-on and uh, mobile client specific settings, uh, and and really the first thing and and I keep forgetting about this except when I go to set up a client uh, is that you actually have to go and set up the server URL that you want it to hit before logging in. Otherwise, you're, where are you logging you're in by to? default logging in Visit to bitwarden.com. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, now they do provide you. Uh, different URLs and, and you have many different URLs that you can set if you want to, but real, really the only one that you have to set is going to be the, the, the top server URL for a self-hosted environment. And that'll, that contains everything, you know, the vault warn has, has the compatibility for everything under that domain. And actually, so there is a PR coming where vault warn changed uh, their uh, environment variables and added a domain setting and I can just pass that, that in slash bit worn string and everything works past that. Um, so it's been super nice because there's a, there was uh, for a time the API server was actually under slash API instead of slash bit worn slash API. Uh, and it perpetually made calls out and back into that slash API. Uh, and so this actually fixes that. So I'm, I'm over the moon with that. That's, that's been really, really good to see, right? Fixes a lot of other problems too. There was also a problem with the admin page that that fixes too as well. So it should be smooth sailing from here, he said confidently. All right, let's see. Unlock with biometrics. We are going over that dark theme, obviously. 
the only sane choice. There are there are two other big ones here. Um, so there's autofill and sync. So for autofill, I've been I've been wondering what's what's your experience with with autofill? I let it go base domain. So okay. uh, I'll tell you what the one annoying thing has been when I spin up instances or actually just our organization instance for uh, compositional enterprises. It's annoying. Because I have, we have all those services at, uh, you know, compositional enterprises dot compose dot com slash whatever slash service name. Uh, that was a little bit annoying, uh, only because I think I had so many test instances up, and I was logging into so much stuff that now it was trying to autofill bad passwords essentially. So I had to go in and delete them from the vault, um, and also a little bit of browser. It was partially my browser's browser's fault. Um, but Bitwarden, every time I logged in, would be like, hey, do you want to save this password? It's like, no, you've been here before. We have it in the vault here. Why aren't you recognizing this? Yeah, and actually I have a note on that. So so I say that if you don't have the URI saved for a site but are using Bitwarden anyways, it will prompt you to add it to a new entry instead of the existing one. So I will admit I do have uh, – there are some services, I think it's specifically – GitLab, GitHub, a lot of developer-related stuff where I log in with I auto it auto I autofill with Bitwarden and then I log in and uh, that ends up being fine. But if I log in just using you know username password and you know one-time token, it's like, hey, do you want to register this in your vault? I'm like, wait, no, I already have this in my vault. So I've run into it a few times. It's really not. It doesn't kill me, but it is one of those things that can be annoying it can i i could definitely see it bugging people and one of the settings here if it does bug you is is to disable that ad login notification All right so the the notification automatically prompts you to save new logins to your vault whenever you log into them for the first time and if you don't want exactly that behavior that you're talking about right that it's would be the box to check yep that that would be the action to take to prevent that annoyance from occurring um uh and and there are a couple other settings here so like you talked about you know you're matching the base domain it goes all the way up the chain you can if you really want to tweak it you can have it doing regex matches or uh matching all subdomains or or, or uh, adding on uh, pathing so there's there's plenty of different ways to to tweak that depending on how nitty-gritty you want to get um and then also uh by default, the clipboard is never cleared, I believe, right? So when you copy a password, it is in your clipboard forever, um, but that can be that can be set as well. You can set a clear after 30 seconds, clear after 15 seconds, yada, yada, yada. Uh, luckily, with the browser add-on, I'm usually just letting it autofill it for me. Yeah. I'm not manually yep. copy the password. Yep. I'm just clicking, yes, I want you to log in with this Username password combo and it autofills it for me in there and then I'm able to log in. Now, do you know if there's a clear clipboard after paste? Because I know some. I was trying to think of. I, I think it's actually uh, KeyPass too, KeyPass XC yeah. that had that feature available, which I did like, but sometimes it caused pain for me. I'll just say, but um, I didn't know if Bitwarden had that same feature available. No, nah, it's it's all time based. Time based. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's at least there. I mean, that's that's another security feature. One of those little things that you know you wouldn't think about until you start start walking through the process. You're like, oh yeah, by the way, I don't want that hanging out in my you know paste buffer for forever. So that's a that's a good dive out on limb. But it is an attack vector. Oh yeah, it's oh, totally yeah. an attack vector. I think you if you go to some sites, they can now. I don't want to speak out, but I think if you go to some sites, they can end up reading. Well, the problem is some sites can read autofill because your password's already in there. They, oh, you know, all they have to have is some JavaScript running. Yes. Now, clipboard, yes. I don't think is as much a threat as that autofill, but wanted to bring up both of those. And that is something to be aware of too, however, because Bitwarden does have the ability to autofill. Like the, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, the... Or, um, I guess I guess autofill. So what do I want to call this? Now, what autofill site you haven't been to? So it it uh, does it without any kind of prompt, right? So I can I can select the one I want it to fill it with, right? But 
Bitwarden does have the ability to, if it detects a matching site, to literally log in with the username and password. And that's what you talk about, because that's a very common attack vector with like Firefox and Chrome and other browsers that save your password, is that you'll hide JavaScript or text fields or whatever, and then the password autofill service will automatically fill it there. And maybe it's imitating an iframe for, you know, city.com or key.com or yourbank.com or whatever. And um, it'll fill it with those details instead of the site that you're logging in with. So, uh, and that can be hidden off, off the page somewhere, you know, CSS negative 500,000, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's somewhere not visible to you. Yeah. But, but that would still be legitimate from the software's point of view. So, um, I never turn that on. Um, just because of that, I, I don't find it eminently usable. Plus the fact that, like you said, you know, I log in to some sites and I might have three or four passwords for that right. too. So I never wanted to auto log me into anything in, but I do want to have that fill, uh, available to me. Uh, and that, fill that's available to me if it gets updated will be synced over all of the devices right which is obviously a benefit uh, over something like like key pass where it's going to be static on one device until you right. sync the backing file all around or, or whatever kind, kind of, of p- setup that pain. you you manage complete right pain. but the the sync uh in in the Clients, obviously, there's not going to be sync of the web client because the web client is a direct interface of the back end. But uh, the sync functionality in the clients is able to be manually kicked off. Um, and that is just in the settings of, of both the uh, mobile as well as the uh, browser add-on. And this is something I don't know. There was actually a, a improvement made a couple of years ago called Live Sync where they're using WebSockets and different push notifications to sync uh, information client to client. Now, I kind of figured that, you know, the the syncing is, is very good in Bitwarden. You know, I, I, I noticed that. I was like, I, wow, they, they really did well here. And this, uh, this blog post uh, for, for live sync on Bitwarden.com site really goes into how they how they implemented that and it's, it's really cool like and and i'm really excited to see just how well they they implemented that I, it's just it's it, it works exactly as it should i mean that's the thing i don't have to think about it it just, it just does it so yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm i'm very happy when when software does its job and does it well so um I did not have anything about the desktop client or the CLI because uh, I frankly don't use those. Uh, so if you do, yeah. feel free to jump in. But no, I actually don't have the uh, Bitwarden desktop instance installed on my desktop. I go web. I go plain web UI. I go the add-on. I would say add-on is number one use. Uh, the web UI yeah. I use two and then like three is mobile. And then I'm sure at one point in time here, I'll start to dive into the CLI just for, it seems like a great way to manage secrets. Um, but des- I do yeah. not have the, de- I do not have that desktop version out there. Uh, actually the only desktop version I have out there in terms of application is Nextcloud. Just kind of a little shout out there to Nextcloud. I do have that Nextcloud for Nextcloud sync and then, next cloud Ditto. mobile yeah. yeah but in terms yeah, of bitwarden yeah. no i'm kind of in the same boat as you add on and then web ui and that just kind of rounds out my my use cases for that that tool right and it it, it does its job and, and does its job well now 